Hello, Moshan viewers. Last time, our good friend Ms. Tom Hefer presented us a climate change model, which came from his alma mater, MIT, and several other reputable institutes. Today, Mr. Hefer is going to further discuss his topic, the science and the policy behind climate change. Moshan viewers, we would like your opinions on these things as well. So be sure to comment after you see this video. In a previous section of Moshang, we talked about the general idea of global warming and what we might be able to do about it. But now we have a specific thing. The so-called Inflation Reduction Act Reduction is actually Act. mostly about measures to deal Single with global Act. warming. So out of 400 and some billion, a total of about 369 billion is actually in climate and clean energy investments. And that includes $135 billion for clean energy tax credits to ramp up solar and wind power, uh, tax incentives for people to buy electric vehicles, and then cutting methane emissions. So now that we have something specific, let's look at whether these measures are effective and what will they do. So previously, we discussed the En-ROADS climate model, which is really nice in that you can go to the En-ROADS website, just Google En-ROADS, and you can use this model to do your own examination of what the effect of various parameters on climate change is. So I'm not going to go into that because we discussed it quite a lot in the previous discussion. But briefly, you can go down here and you can look at energy supply and you can change what extent of renewables are being implemented. So uh, if you push this slider all the way over, you get lots of solar panels, lots of windmills. In transport, if you go to electrification of vehicles, you get over here essentially 100% adoption of electric vehicles. And then here, there's a lot of information in this, but here's the important thing. It shows you over here what the temperature rise is going to be through the end of the century. In other words, about 80 years from now in the year 2100 and all along. So the question then is, what are the effects of maximum global use of wind, solar, and electric vehicles? Because this model is the entire globe, not just the United States. So let's have a look. What happens if we maximize global use of renewables. Well, here it is. We've slid the slider bar all the way over. And you may recall that in the base case, we had 3.6 degrees of temperature rise by the year 2100. And if we maximize the use of renewable around the entire world, we get two tenths of one degree of reduction in temperature by the year 2100, 80 years from now. So what about electric vehicles? Well, even less. We get one-tenth of one degree of temperature decrease by the year 2100. So that's if the whole world does it. But the Inflation Reduction Act only pertains to the United States. So who are the producers of carbon dioxide in the world? Well, here are the big five. At the very, very top is China. And you can see they've had a huge recent increase in carbon dioxide output because they have implemented a large number of coal-fired power plants to sustain their economy. Here's the United States. We actually peaked out before 2020, and we've actually been on a downslope. So some of the carbon dioxide reduction measures are working. And we currently only account for about 13.5% of the world total, which is about a little more than one-eighth. And then the European Union is also on a downslope. They're down here. India is undergoing a very rapid increase because their economy is developing. And here's Russia, which has a smaller economy, peaked out back in about uh, oh, 1990, I guess that would be. And then it went down as the Soviet economy went down. And now it's generally rising a little bit. So, so these are the big five. And they're the ones who dominate carbon dioxide production in the world. So what can we do by ourselves? If we only look at what's in the Inflation Reduction Act, which addresses the United States, we can at most increase renewables use about one-eighth of the world total, 13.5%.
Same thing with electric vehicle utilization. And then there is some methane reduction also in that bill. So if we look at what the net effect of that is on world temperature, if the U.S. implements all of the measures in the Inflation Reduction Act, we get one-tenth of one degree reduction in 80 years. And if we look at a nearer time frame, 30 years from now, 2052, it's even less than that. It's one twentieth of a degree. And yet the 369 billion dollars comes out to over one thousand dollars for every man woman and child in the united states so the question is your children will be grown up in 2052 is less than one twentieth of a degree change worth four thousand dollars for a family of four and more to the point is this the best way to spend the money some people say well, we need to set a good example. Then the rest of the world will go along. But we assume that other nations have the same priorities that we do, but they don't. Let's take Russia. Russia depends on fossil fuel exports for the most of its economy, and it gains from climate change. The entire Asian portion of Russia is coal and dry, and global warming will bring warmer temperatures and more rain to that area. So it's in their advantage to have global warming. So there's no way that they are going to cooperate with uh, carbon dioxide reduction measures. India. India might like lower temperatures, but they have now the world's largest population, and they have a lot of poverty, and they're trying to develop their economy. Their people use fossil fuels for heating their homes and for cooking and for driving their vehicles, they're not going to sacrifice their economy just so that the rest of the world can get a tenth of a degree of temperature reduction. The European Union, they support the idea of greenhouse gas reduction, but now they're facing the grim reality of energy shortages. Their energy prices have gone up by more than a factor of 10. And this is going to be a cold, expensive winter for them. They're estimating that in the United Kingdom, that the average electric bill for this year is going to be over $7,000. And then there's China. China is by far the largest and the most rapidly growing producer of greenhouse gases. And if you remember the curve that we had of producers, here's China. This curve isn't going to change anytime soon. They're going to be producing more CO2, not less. So what do we do now? The spending on solar, wind, and electric cars, especially just within the U.S., will produce no noticeable results within our lifetime. And the rest of the world is not going to play along with us. So are there things that we could possibly do that would show greater results more rapidly and that we could do on our own if no one else wants to join us? There are two possibilities. One is direct carbon dioxide removal from the air, and the other is climate engineering. So what are these and how might they work? Well, direct CO2 removal is very interesting. You take air into manufacturing plants such as this, and then you remove the carbon dioxide using a chemical process, and you store it underground in some type of a storage facility. And Right here is an operating carbon dioxide removal plant that's in Iceland. It removes about 4,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year, which sounds like a lot. But unfortunately, when billions of tons are being produced, it really makes a very small dent. So currently, our capabilities are very small scale and very expensive. But if the cost could be cut by 90% or more, as has been done with solar panels, it could turn out to be affordable. And here is what's happened with solar panels over the last 20 years. Since 1999, the price has gone from $5 per watt down here to about 30 cents per watt, more than a 90% reduction. So it is possible with R&D to achieve these kinds of cost reductions. One possibility, what's climate engineering? Climate engineering refers to methods of blocking part of the sunlight before it reaches Earth. And it mimics the observed actions from volcanoes. When large volcanoes erupt, they put a lot of ash into the air. And this blocks the sunlight and results in immediate cooling. So this graph is a graph of what's called effective radiative forcing. And all that means is the sunlight that reaches the earth, making it hotter 
Or is there less sunlight reaching the Earth, and so the Earth is actually cooling down? And it's broken down into a variety of components. Carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, is this purple line. And you can see this goes all the way back to 1750. But in, starting in about 1950, this line goes up and up and up and up. And that's basically the main cause of global warming today. There are others. Here's the line for methane. And there are other gases that are in here. But interestingly, there are things that also depress radiative forcing. So two of them are aerosols, that's particles that are in the air, and volcanoes, which throw all this ash and dust way up into the stratosphere. So that's this green line, which kind of overlays the black line before there was industrialization. But down here, you can see Mount Pinatubo in 1991. And that forced the total line, which is this black line, to go actually below zero in 1991. If you're old like me, here's what happened to the temperature. Temperature in the 80s and early 90s was going up and up and up and up. And then Mount Pinatubo erupted. And for a couple of years, the temperature went back down. And then the aerosols cleared out and started going back up again. But more dramatically than that was the biggest volcano that we know about in recorded history, which is Mount Tambora, which erupted in 1815. And that caused such a dramatic temperature drop. It was called, the, 1816 was called the year without a summer. And it actually snowed on the 4th of July. So how could you mimic a volcano? We can't cause volcanoes to erupt when we want them to. But here are a couple of concepts. So this just shows volcanoes erupting and producing ash in the stratosphere. That could be mimicked by putting up balloons with supply hoses that would put the same kind of more particulate material up into the stratosphere. And it would have the same effect on sunlight as the volcanic ash. But we could control it. We could do a little bit at first, and then if that works out, do more. There are other ideas. You can use seawater to whiten clouds to make them less transparent so that more sunlight is reflected out into space. And then there have even been experiments, the only successful ones really being by the Russians, at putting large mirrors would get to the Earth. If you put a very large array of mirrors up into space, you could control how much sunlight would get to the Earth. Now, these technologies are all immature and would have to be studied a great deal before they could be implemented. But in summary, the current approaches that we are taking to reducing global warming are very expensive. They require the rest of the world to follow along. And even so, they will not produce significant change during our lifetimes. There are potential approaches that can be implemented by small groups of countries and that produce results much sooner, but they require significant research and development, somewhat like the Manhattan Project and like the moonshot that produced between 1961 when it was announced and 1969 when the astronauts landed on the moon, a scientific revolution. So the question that I ask is, wouldn't it be better to spend our money on something that we can do and it would have an effect during our lifetimes. So that's my discussion of the Inflation Reduction Act and the climate measures contained within it for today. Do you have any questions? Very good presentation, thank you. My biggest concern is currently those kind of policy are deeply manipulated by a well, politician, especially the technocrats, but they don't see a big gain in politics. They could not follow science and the technology, but follow political science. So do you think, is that easy to convince them? Well, you're right to be concerned. However, I think that there could be sold on the carbon dioxide removal from the air. There are actually incentives that have been put into the Inflation Reduction Act to try to get companies to do this. Now, what they really need is to also put in money for research and development, because right now we simply cannot do it on the scale or at a cost that we can afford. But if we can do the research and development to bring the cost down in 10 years or even 20 years, it would be 
far, far ahead of where we will be simply by trying to implement more windmills, solar panels, and electric vehicles. And similarly with the climate engineering, there's going to be a lot of discussion about what are the adverse effects of that. Because if you put something up in the air, there's going to be some kind of an effect that you hadn't anticipated and that you don't want. So there, what I would say, but it is something that we can do all by ourselves, or better yet, in concert with the European Union and whoever would join us. But I think with that, what we want to do is start small and then see how it works and see if there are any adverse consequences. Study it first, of course. And then if it works out, that's something that you can control almost perfectly. You can put up more or less, depending on what you need to do. So I think that those are things that can be brought to the attention of politicians. And if they are serious about addressing climate change and global warming, I think that they are getting there now because of all of the floods and wildfires and the things that people can see. And I think that they can be incentivized to do it, just as they have done previously for windmills and solar panels and electric cars. There's nothing wrong with those things. It's just that they don't accomplish what we need to have accomplished. So taking that money and putting it into more effective manners, I think, is an idea that gradually can be sold to politicians. Great. I agree, and I hope that will happen in a way of benefit our middle class. Also, I saw dangerous in tendency. So one side wanted to weaponize climate change as their best agenda to attract to voters. However, if you look at their strategy, they would rather choose to collaborate with authoritarian and dictatorship countries than to collaborate with the opponent in the U.S. I I think that you're correct. And it is certainly true that the United States and every country needs an assured and growing supply of energy. Now, there's nothing wrong with windmills and solar panels, but of course, they don't work when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. So you have to have something to back them up. And instead, you have to answer is, well, if you have to put in that backup power to begin with, what's the point? You know, you have to, do you have to pay twice for your energy, once for the windmill and then for the backup plant or the battery or whatever it is? I have thought for the longest time that the answer to that would be to put small new generation nuclear power plants out where the coal and gas fired plants are now because they already have the hookups and the infrastructure transmit the electricity to the places that it needs to go and you can do a swap out of coal plant for the nuclear plant now we need to develop those also because the old technologies the ones that are currently being used have shown that they actually are safe, but they're not foolproof and scary. They can result in radiation releases. The new technologies step around that. They have ways of assuring that there cannot be meltdown and there cannot be radiation releases. And in addition, they produce much less fuel nuclear waste. To me, that is the path forward. It's a long-term path. It's not something that we can implement tomorrow. But if we're looking out to the year 2100, that's where I would like to see us go. Appreciate it for your coming back. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye, Mosheng viewers. We want to hear from you.